Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CRE PN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is J. Darren Gross. This is the podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today's interview is sponsored by Building Insurance and Risk. When you invest in real estate, you need to protect yourself and your investment from catastrophic loss. The experts at Building Insurance and Risk provide you with multiple offers and a side-by-side -side coverage comparison. To learn more, go to buildinginsurancerisk.com. Today, my guest is Brad Hansen. Brad has been in the mortgage business for 18 years, helping clients meet with home financing goals. He also is a real estate investor and loves to educate others on how to build wealth through real estate. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Brad about great products and strategies for becoming a real estate investor. But first, a couple of reminders. If you'd like, or if you, if you can, we'd love to have you, let me say this again. If you like our show, like I've never said this before, if you like our show, CREPN Radio, there are a couple of things you can do to help us out. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we encourage you to leave a comment. We'd love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you want to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Brad Hansen. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thanks. Great to be here with you, Darren. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, but before we get started, if you could take just a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Yeah, you bet. Like you said earlier, I've been in the mortgage business for about 18 years. Uh, I'm a branch manager, and so I'm also an originator. So I have um, worked with clients, thousands of clients over the last 18 years. And like you said, I, I, I really love helping people achieve their goals. Uh, and we do everything from really primary residence, second homes, investment properties, construction, um, but it's all very uh, residential focused, right? So resident, residential investment typically includes one to four units, although we have some options to go up to eight units. So yeah, really love what I do. I think it's uh, home ownership. I believe really strongly in home ownership um, and investment as a, uh, you know, investment properties as a way of investing as well. No, I love it. So if you could, Brad, uh, what, what's the, the difference between an, uh, an investor versus a, an owner occupied uh, yeah. as far as uh, lending um, uh, requirements, or I guess kind of if you could differentiate between the two? Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a good question. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, the, the um, lender, and we use uh, a, a number of different um, lenders that help provide the funds, right? So we're the originator. A little bit about Academy Mortgage. We um, originate the loan, which basically means take the application. We work with the client directly. We will, we will underwrite the loan. We'll fund the loan. But then the loan will sometimes go to different investors. So it might be Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, USDA. But then we also have private investors, right? They portfolio these loans. We see that a lot with Jumbo. Um, and all of these investors, they will categorize their loan risk based on, is it a primary residence? Are they going to live in that home for 12 months, uh, up to 12 months? Because normally when you, when you get a loan, you say, this is going to be my primary residence. You'll say, hey, I'm going to live in this for the next 12 months. Uh, now things can change and sometimes there are exceptions to that. And then of course, a second home is a home that you don't live in primarily, but it typically will be in a, um, place where people vacation. You know, here in Oregon, it's at the coast, it's in the mountains, it's out in Bend, it's on river. Um, you can't have a second home that's next door to you, right? That right. Just doesn't qualify. Um, and then, of course, an investment property is one that you're not going to be living in. Um, and those can be um, really anywhere. It could be the house next door to you if you want. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about the last few years is we're beginning to see um, what I'll call, you know, I think the term house hacking is kind of the 
the term for this, but people will see their primary residence and say, hey, how do I leverage my primary residence to also make money with it? Um, they might use Airbnb, move out for the weekend. They might get an ADU. So the, the thing that's exciting about real estate right now is we have more products and tools and options than ever before to help people finance but also there's more options for investors, right? It's not just a long, you know, long-term rental. You can do short-term, you can do all kinds of different things with it. Um, so that's, I think, one of the exciting things about being in, in real estate. And even if you're a primary, even if it's your primary property, it's still an investment too. I mean, you get to live there and enjoy all the benefits, but I have personally made more money from the homes I've owned than I, I have from the stock market in terms of return on investment. Yeah, no, it's a good case to make for the uh, positive market with real estate there. Um, so I'm curious, so between the two or, or the multiple different uh, uh, options, you know, whether it be a primary or a vacation mm -hmm. or a rental, uh, how how is it that the lenders view, if you could kind of, is it like um, percentage down payment required? Is it uh, right. the, I mean, when it comes to, um, you know, your ability to qualify for a loan. Yeah. What are some of the factors they look at in those different scenarios? Yeah, you bet. So um, with a primary residence, you have um, typically much uh, more options when it comes to your down payment, right? So we have, for a primary residence, if you're a first time home buyer, we have zero down loans, a, mul a multiple different zero down loans or down payment assistance programs. Typically for those, you have to be a uh, first-time home buyer, uh, but even with that, you, we have three percent down. We have five percent down. Some low down payment programs, right? Those are what are available for a primary residence, but you're going to live in that home. When it comes to investment properties, um, the minimum down we have a loan that you can put as little as ten percent down, but 10, 15 percent down, depending on the, the the investor that we talked about. Those are kind of the options that we have. Um, we have a great portfolio loan that I've used myself. That's a 10% down, no mortgage insurance, um, and it's a portfolio uh, investor product. Um, so still pretty good, but most of the time when you're getting into higher units, so three, four, four plexes, they're wanting to see 25% down. And typically the, the larger the down payment that you have on an investment property, the better your, your interest rate and your fees are on these. So yeah. any again, um, well, I'm not necessarily going to quote interest rates uh, because everyone's situation's different. We're seeing right now interest rates are a lot higher than they have been in the last couple of years. We've been, you know, in these COVID lows. We had uh, the Fed um, and their actions created the lowest rates we've seen in history, I think, uh, during 2020 and 2021. And as we came into 2022, um, really, toward the beginning, we started to see rates climb because of inflation. Um, and again, that has caused a lot of people to slow down, take a pause. But anytime the, the crowd is going one direction, there's going to be opportunity for others, right? So I've talked to a lot of investors, and they, they feel like now is a great time to buy because, number one, they're not competing with four, five, six other people, right? So they can go in, they can typically get concessions from a from a seller to help cover some of their costs. And they feel like even though rates are higher, maybe their cash flow is not going to be quite as good during this time. They can actually take advantage of get, get some more, more opportunities to buy properties during this time. Yeah. I was going to ask you just about that, the <clears throat> kind of the current situation. Uh, like you mentioned, Fed rates uh, are increasing and, and, you know, the mortgage rates, I think everybody assumes that they're always, uh, coupled uh, to the rate, but uh, mm. are, are you seeing that? Is that the case today, or is or is or where yeah. we're in relation just to the spread? I guess, or is there right, a spread? right? Good question. So there is a lot of confusion. People sometimes think when the Fed takes their Fed rate up, right? That's the money that banks lend to one another. It's kind of the overnight rate. They um, they think that is how mortgage rates are determined. And actually, it's sometimes what we'll do is we'll see the Fed take their rate up and interest rates will actually drop. And the reason is because the Fed is taking their rate up to fight inflation. 
right? Inflation is the enemy really of bonds and mortgages are bonds. So you hear about um, um, mortgage-backed securities. Those are bonds. Those are sold on the market. They're, they're you know, the, when, we, when we do a loan, the typically, unless it's a portfolio loan and the bank or investor is keeping it, uh, but your typical Fannie, Freddie, uh, Ginny Mae loans, these are packaged and sold as um, mortgage-backed securities on the secondary market. And then that's what determines the rate. So those rates will go up or down based on inflation, based on demand. And so, you know, during the 21, 20, 2021 time, what the Fed was doing, not only did they take their Fed rate down to basically zero, um, but they also were buying mortgage-backed securities. And just like anything else, it's kind of a supply and demand, right? So they're buying up all these mortgage-backed securities. That's driving... Uh, the price down, right? So that's part of the reason why we saw rates, you know, a 30-year uh, traditional conventional loan, rates were in the upper upper twos, low threes, you've got good credit. Um, and, you know, now they're, they've more than doubled, right? Um, and then typically an investor rate is about uh, anywhere from a half to a point higher than a regular conventional loan. But it's interesting because right now we're actually seeing the conventional rates, the Fannie Freddie, you know, driven rates are actually higher than jumbo rates. So we're seeing some jumbo mm -hmm. rates that are lower. And it's really a little bit interesting right now because you're not, if a lot of the rates are not following their traditional rules. Typically, a jumbo rate is slightly higher than a conventional rate. Right now they're lower, right? We're seeing them anywhere from a half to a point lower because a lot of those are driven by the banks, right? Some of these big banks, they're, they, they're in maybe the sixes. And if the conventional rate's in the sevens, they're, they're thinking, hey, I'm make, we're making enough money on this. We don't want, um, when rates start to drop, we don't want those rates to run off, right? We don't want them to be refinanced right away because the banks or the servicers, they make their money and the investor, they make their money on holding those loans and those notes for a while, um, and they're making the interest on them, right? So it's really changed the dynamic. We have, the, we have, I think, the highest rates in 21 years, I just read recently. Um, and that scares a lot of people. But again, anytime you have a lot of people that get scared to say, hey, I don't want to, I'm going to wait on the sidelines to buy that home, what that means is it means opportunity that's out there. And some markets are worse than others, right? I've heard Arizona right now that uh, home prices have dropped significantly inventory has gone you know triple double or quadruple what it's been uh, since the beginning of the year here in Oregon while we've seen inventory go up uh, we haven't seen it go up significantly um, I think the last number I saw it went from 1.8 months up to like 2.2 months so again supply and demand has a lot to do back in the great recession you know back in 08 09 we saw inventory up to 11, 12 months, right? There was too much supply. And now we don't have that problem. Um, and it's really diff we're at a different time than we were back in 08, 09 when we had the, those market, that market volatility. Right now, um, back then I had uh, my, my, uh, my loan options went from, you know, 15 pages of loan options to one, right? I had a, I had a 30 year and a 20 year loan. Uh, and nobody wanted to do, the risk was way low. Now we still have a ton of opportunities and products um, for home buyers, whether it's for a primary, an investment property, um, things like that. We're starting to see you know, more creative. And part of that, the thing that has helped is they've tightened up a lot of the guidelines, right? So they're not giving the old no income, no asset loans or stated loans. Um, they're really solid loans. Uh, it does help that, that you know, uh, unemployment's low, that jobs are strong, things like that. So, it, you know, the economy does impact um, our, you know, what we have, what we can offer as well. Yeah, no, it, it is kind of a, um, you know, weird how, uh, you know, when we go through these cycles, uh, especially like the 08, uh, mm. you know, cycle where everybody, I mean, it, just the, the, the lending environment was basically anybody could get a loan and, and multiple, right. had multiple properties and, you know, probably, uh, I don't know what the percentages were, but enough people had them that it created this, 
this false market that basically yep. couldn't support itself. <clears throat> and right. uh, so then, uh, and I forget what, what were the measures they put in place there? Uh, Cause it was like, weren't, I mean, I know they, they, they tightened up the, um, uh, not the inspection, but the appraisals and, mm -hmm. and some of the, the, the loan requirements and that, but I mean, basically yeah. some of the, they, they narrowed the opportunity for this problem to reoccur and now we have, yeah. I mean, the last couple of years, like we're talking about how rates have been so low. Is there any kind of number industry-wide, like a percentage of people that actually refinance to a, a lower rate mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, still have a <laughs> right. higher rate? Right. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I'll answer your first question first. So um, you asked about what were some of the main things that changed. Uh, on the appraisal side, they instituted a um, home value code of conduct which was really good. And what that did is that created a um, separate function. So you couldn't just have your own appraisers go out and give you values. And, you know, I think, um, you know, that was really good. I think having um, some accountability with appraisals and banks and lenders, so you weren't just getting false values, right? So bringing more guidelines into that and more rules, I think was really good. Now, maybe they've gone a little too far and we've actually had a, appraiser shortages, um, but then they've instituted things in recently like um, appraisal waivers. So if they're doing a lot more electronic appraisals, that's your primary hmm. residence. Um, and so that's, that actually has helped. Um, then the other thing they did is they've instituted, and I won't go into all the details, but basically they instituted an ability to repay rule. Right. So we've as a lender, we have got to make sure when we underwrite that loan, we can show that this borrower has the ability to repay. Right. Are we verifying their income? Are we verifying their assets, their credit, their debts, all those things? And then we have very specific guidelines, um, typically 50% um, debt to income ratio when you look at their, your housing costs, as well as your all of your other debt is pretty much the maximum. There are some exceptions with FHA and VA, um, but that's kind of about the max. When it comes to an investor loan, typically 45% debt to income ratio is about the max. And when it comes to a jumbo loan, most of those loans have been limited to uh, 43%. Now, again, we have other loan programs. Uh, the old subprime is gone, but there's a new category they call non-qualified mortgages. And non-qualified mortgages are an opportunity to for self-employed borrowers to use bank statements or assets for income. They're still they still have this ability to repay rule as part of it, but they're just using um, they're using bank statements or um, maybe it's a 1099 employee or some things like that that don't fit into the the box. We've got options for some of those people, and then typically those rates will reflect the risk that are, is associated with that type of product. So I really feel like there's been a lot of really good things that have happened over the last, um, you know, what is that now, 14 years or so um, yeah. since that happened. Um, you know, just the basic rules and and they brought some more sanity to that. I, I, I started in 04 and I still remember when I came in and someone was telling me about the no income, no asset, no employment loan. And I, and and the rate wasn't even that much different. I was a little bit surprised by that and really didn't do most of those kind of things. Um, a lot of those people that focused on subprime, many of those people got out of the business or switched out of subprime. And, uh, you know, obviously we don't need to go into yeah. the disaster that happened in 08, 09, but it took a while to get through that. But I think, you know, kind of where I was going with this is that, you know, the fundamentals in the market in 08, entirely different than the fundamentals yeah. right now. Absolutely. And I think that there's a, a sense that uh, history is going to repeat itself and that we're going to have this big wash of mm. foreclosures and, and uh, there's going to be all the supply on the, on the market. Right. When in fact, there's, I mean, what I read and see is that there's a housing shortage. Uh, That's in, right. In mo most markets, so there's still demand. Yeah. I think yeah. the, the, the challenge we have in any, any market or any situation where there's change it's there's there's a sense or there, there's a time for people to kind of re get their you know get their footing to understand what is the market right. as opposed to feel like you know it's too risky or it's not what it was or it's not what I think it's going to be yeah 
And um, so I don't yeah. know if if you have any kind of thoughts on that or if there's any kind of a, you know, what you're seeing. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing the activity level has changed for you here in the last couple of months. Absolutely. You, you asked a question about, you know, how many people refinanced, right? Um, what percentage? And I don't know that I've seen a percentage, but um, it was a lot. I mean, it was, it was, um, if I remember correctly, the, the number of mortgages that were done um, was last year in 2021 was like 4 trillion or something like that. Um, it was a giant number. And this year, I think it's expected to be closer to like 1.5 trillion or something. And again, I'm, my numbers are probably off, but the, the percentages are, are similar in the sense that I'm, I, you know, it's funny because every once in a while I'll talk to a client who didn't refinance and I'm actually really surprised that they didn't refinance during that time, but you don't know what they were going through, right? So they might have been unemployed during the time or they might have had um, a foreclosure or a bankruptcy or other things that happened um, that are going on. And the one thing that we're seeing this year is we're still seeing people that want to upsize or downsize. There's a big demand from millennials that, you know, they were competing with four, five, six, ten other people last year, and they couldn't get into it. Now is the time for them. And like I said, even as an investor, now is the time that you don't have to necessarily overpay for a home, right? You might actually get it for less than asking, get some concessions. Um, and I know we'll talk about some products here, but we do have a, we have a lot more. That's the other big difference. Like I was was saying, I went down from the 15 page rate sheet down to one page. And now I'm with the change that we've had with rates going up, I still have even more um, loan options than ever before. No. Well, let's talk about some of the products yeah. uh, that you have. Yeah, you bet. So um, as I mentioned, you've got your kind of traditional agency loans and then you've got portfolio and private. So I'll just kind of walk through a few different ones. Um, but I'm going to start with actually one that I think is kind of one of my favorites. It's a new one. Fannie Mae just came out with a new, um, they call it the Fannie Mae um, ADU uh, product loan. So I could, um, if I have a home, I could actually, you know, get a line of credit, build an ADU on my property. And then this loan allows you to basically pay that off and consolidate the loan. Or you could even purchase a home that has an ADU and you can use the rental income from that ADU, from the auxiliary dwelling unit to, um, to qualify. And, um, you know, that's something, let's say you have a, someone who's buying a home and they're buying a duplex, right? So you could buy a duplex, live in one side and rent out the other side. And we can actually use the rental income from the other unit to help you qualify for a home. So what's really interesting is um, a lot of times it's easier to qualify when you're buying an investment property or some sort of property that will, whether it's a plex, something that's got an ADU, um, you know, or let's say I own a home and I want to buy an investment property. I can actually get a rent schedule from the appraiser and I can use those rents to help me qualify. Um, if I'm buying a, an invest, if I'm buying a vacation property, I can't use the rental income from it. Um, so it's a little harder to qualify, but investment properties, you can use those. Now, not, not all banks allow that. I know, um, you know, for us, with the way we do business, Fannie Mae does, um, so a lot of our investors do. Uh, typically, when you're buying a jumbo, which uh, in our market, jumbo is any loan amount that's above $647,200. And um, most investors want to see, or I'm sorry, jumbo loans, they want to see that you've got a history of investing. So, you know, one of the things I always talk to people about is uh, walk before you run when it comes to investing, right? Um, years ago, back in 08, um, I had heard about people who were buying four, five, six, seven properties at a time, right? Well, they fell hard, right? Because they didn't just buy one, they just bought multiple because they could buy them on 100% loans and other things, or 80-20s, if you remember the old 80-20. Um, and they had those even for investors. So especially if you're a new, a new uh, investor, I would say, um, you know, definitely take it slow. Do one at a time or do one of these house hacks that we're talking about where you buy a duplex, live in one side, rent out the other. Um, we've seen a lot of people too, where they'll buy their home and then uh, a year later, they'll turn that into a rental 
and then they'll buy another home, right? So we've seen people build a rental portfolio by, by buying them, living in them, maybe fixing them up, turning it into a rental, and then going and buying another new investment or another new primary. Um, the, when you're, like I said, when you're buying a home, you're basically saying, if it's your primary, I'm going to be living in this for the next 12 months. So you don't have to um, keep that home as a primary residence for, you know, the rest of the time you own the home. It's just for one year that you're committed to. So we'll see people, they do it that way, do it slowly. Maybe every couple of years, they're buying a new primary, converting their old one into an investment property from there. Um, so that's that's one of my new, it's pretty new. It's a new favorite that you can actually use the ADU because most of the time when you're buying a primary, you can't use room rents or order income or, or things like that. So you've got your traditional Fannie Freddie loans. And for most of those, your minimum down payment is uh, 15% down for kind of your traditional conventional Fannie Freddie loans. Um, you can, uh, and then if you go to a, um, Brad, is that 15%? Is that, is that for yeah, an investor? For a single or that, family. That's investor. for a single family. So investor, single okay. family investor. So let's say I was buying a, um, an investment property, single family home. I need to bring at least 15% down. That's for like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Now, like I mentioned, I do have a investor um, um, portfolio program that you can go 10% down. The rate's a little bit higher than the Fannie Freddie one right now. Uh, but it doesn't have mortgage insurance. And anytime you're not putting 20% down, you're going to have mortgage insurance that you need to bring. And so with the Fannie Freddie loan, you would have um, uh, mortgage insurance if you're not putting at least 20% down. Now, if you go to a plex, um, to, let's say it's a two plex, a du duplex, two or three plex, and you're going to live, you're going to live in one of them, then that will that will help as well, right? Because you can buy it as a primary residence. We can um, we can use that. And that one, um, typically, I think that's 15% down on that one. Um, you also have, for people who are more low to moderate income, uh, you can only be 80% of the area median income. We've got Home Ready and Home Possible, which are both, um, as a Fannie and a Freddie, um, loans. They, they require, they have income limits, they have uh, home um, education requirements. And with those, you can get into um, like a Plex for 15% down, um, or again, four to three to four unit would require 25% down, right? So and that's 80%. That's the maximum amount of income for that they can have. 80%. Yeah, it's 80% of the, area, of the median. area median income. Right, so those are for people that have lower. Now, honestly, those are really challenging, right? Because homes yeah. have gotten so expensive, it is difficult. But um, you know, on some of those, you can you can count the um, rental income on some of those as well. Um, but you know, it, it just gets a little bit more complicated when you do those things. I mean, for um, for most people, when they're buying an investment property, they're not normally living in those. Um, but there are options to, to live in the, you know, maybe you buy a two plex or, you know, a three plex, four plex, and you live in one of them, rent out the other. So you can count that. FHA is another one. Um, you can go three and a half percent down as long as you're going to live in the home because FHA is only for primary residents, but you can buy a plex um, with those. Um, the one thing you have to be careful with FHA loans, though, is if it's a three or four unit um, uh, complex then you have it has to it has something called a self-sufficiency test which means it has to be able to qualify just with the rents that are there so that again can be a little bit difficult with the price of flexes these days a lot of investors uh love you know flexes because you have multiple uh borrower or multiple renters in the in the homes okay. um, so yeah we've got your traditional fannie freddie you've got fha um, we've got the investor product. And then we also are seeing more recently in the last few years, jumbo loans are starting to come in. And um, with the jumbo loans, typically each 20% down for a um, single unit and then 25 to 30% for a four, three to two to three, sorry, two to four unit uh, property. 
but those jumbo loans, uh, the one, some of the ones we have, they can go up to one point a million two hundred fifty thousand. So you've got some bigger loan amounts, but you've got um, a lot more requirements on those. You've got the debt to income ratio is 30, 43% or lower. Uh, you've got to have typically reserves anywhere from six to 24 months, just a lot harder when you're going into those, those type of products. But we even have products that, and as I mentioned that non-QM, there are investor properties or investment products with the non-QM, which means we can use bank statement loans, we can use um, asset, uh, and then we even have something called the DSCR, which is the debt service coverage ratio. So it's, um, you've got to have um, the, de the, the, the debt to income ratio on that one is, I think, um, I think it's 20%. You've got to have at least 20% down, uh, but it's got the, the rental income on that property uh, has to be able to support the payment, right? Um, and then they have an option for short term rental. As well, people are starting to recognize that folks will will have some properties that will be used for Airbnb, VRBO, those kind of things. And typically, if you're going to use short-term rental for income, they want a much higher down payment. Typically, that's like a 35 percent down. Um, so the thing that's nice about the different options we have is everybody's situation is a little different. Some people are self-employed. Some people are using income from rental properties. And we can really customize their, you know, we've got a lot of different product options depending on the different borrowers situations. Um, but again, my, I, always, I always come back down, walk before you run, right? Don't try to overdo it when you're getting into uh, being a, an investor. Hey, Brad, what about uh, a, a, you know, buying a property that needs some work? Um, yeah. Say you can get it for just for round numbers, just say it's, you can buy it for a hundred. Yeah. You've got thirty uh, down, but it yeah. needs it needs thirty or forty. Right? Um, is there any product that you have that will help uh, provide funds for the, the renovations or repairs that are needed? Yeah, yeah. Actually, for an investment just, property. Yeah, for investment. So we just did this actually for uh, one of our borrowers. It was a property at the coast. And hundred thousand is probably not a realistic number. Right, I was just saying for easy number. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give you this percentages. this exact yeah. example. So, the property was not financeable. Um, it it had just a number of things wrong with it that didn't make it uh, financeable in a traditional sense. The borrower had twenty percent down. They bought it for three hundred thousand, and they um, were they ended up putting in about seventy five thousand dollars in improvements. And the home ultimately appraised for four hundred fifty thousand. In oh, that man. situation, we actually used a private money lender. Sometimes people call them hard money lenders, right? So the borrower was able to um, get the funds within within a week. They were able to, um, you know, get the hard money loan. They closed on the purchase. They brought their down payment, and then we did the. Um, we did the refinance once the home was done. We did the appraisal and we basically were able to pay off that hard money loan. And again, hard money loans are meant to be short term, right? They're meant to be able to help you get into something that maybe isn't financeable and you don't have 100% cash, right? Um, in this case, um, in this particular case, you know, it was like three points to for the fees and 12% for the interest. Uh, but it's short term. You're only they only needed it for a couple months, and then we were able to refinance them out of that into a permanent loan. Um, and like I said, that because it was not financeable, they were able to get a really good deal at it. You know, for three hundred thousand on this home, and when we appraised it, it was appraised at four hundred um, four hundred fifty thousand. So they made money. They had a property that they're now going to be using for probably short term rentals, and then enjoying it themselves at the coast as well. And that same concept can be used in other situations where you have, um, you would need to close quickly. You need to be able to um, not have the, them worry about if it's, you know, got all the plumbing or it's missing siding or whatever, right? There might be issues. Um, we do have, so um, Fannie Mae um, actually does have a product called Home Ready. And that's for something that, let's say it needs a new roof or 
you want to put new appliances. So that actually is another property uh, product that we have. Um, it's a traditional loan. It's uh, basically the rehab, Fannie Mae's rehab loan. And we can do the same thing. Um, that one is a little bit more complicated, takes a lot more time because you've got to get bids and just is a lot longer. So the other one went really fast and it was more appealing to the seller because they didn't have this big, you know, 60 day, uh, 75 day process waiting for contractors and everybody else to come in. It's a much tighter process, but it's a good, that's a good product as well. And it's sort of one all in one loan, right? So it's the purchase when you buy, when you buy it, um, and you could do it as a re rehab, uh, refinance as well. Um, basically, you're getting that money set aside. And as the work is completed, um, that money is drawn and pay, you pay off the construction uh, or the, the rehab part of it to the contractor. So, Yeah, I was going to say the, the speed at which you can get your funds, I think that's probably a, a point worth reiterating because yeah, uh, it's one thing to, to have an advertised rate of, you know, below or, or super low or whatever, but the, you know, how much uh, ground glass you have to crawl over to get to it kind of thing, as opposed to something you can get it, you know, like I said, relatively yeah. easily and, and actually close on the deal and, uh, you know, have an advantage with the seller as opposed to, now I think right. I, I've, I've heard about this done before and I know it's available mm -hmm. and my, my broker says I can and, yeah. and uh, you know, be more of an you easy. You have to be one. careful. You got to have yeah. the right people. I mean, yeah. we have, we have, um, uh, you know, a few different relationships, but, you know, the people that we've seen have high integrity, they they finance these things, they set the money aside. I mean, you have to be careful with that, right? And um, having a history to know who can help you in, in the right situations um, is really important. The other thing that I think is really important as people get into investments is, number one, they want to make sure that they're not looking at this as a short-term quick fix, right? I mean, we're not talking about fix and flip kind of thing, right? Yeah. We're going to buy it, fix it, sell it up. We don't, we don't do that kind of thing. Uh, the hard money people do. <laughs> That's not something we do. Um, you know, um, but, it, you know, typically when you're looking at uh, buying an investment property, the idea is you want to hold that for seven to 10 years, right? And over that seven to 10 years, um, number one, you're going to have the, um, your renter, paying the principal down for you, right? Not only are they paying the interest on the loan, but they're also paying principal. So you've got a, you've got all of this principal buy down that you're gaining, gaining that someone else is buying this for it. And then you have your appreciation on the home, right? So what I'll do for investors, we have a uh, investor um, analysis that we do for borrowers. And we look at it over 10, seven, 10 years. We look at what are some appreciation expectations. We look at not just what your principal interest, taxes, insurance, HOA fees. We also look at what's your expected maintenance fees, right? Um, and you want to build all that in and then you can look and see, hey, is this, is, is this right for me? Is this an investment? And typically in the first couple of years when you're putting money into the home, whether it's the cost for the um, closing costs and the taxes and insurance and everything, typically the first couple of years, you're really not making money on those. Uh, in some cases you can, if it's a long-term investment. Um, but most of the time, it's more really over time, right? Because your payment stays the same over time. You can start raising your rates or your rents. Um, and soon, you know, you're making more money on this through, you know, like I said, appreciation, principal reduction, and then, of course, cash flow over time as well. So we, we will do a full cash flow and uh, investment analysis for the clients as they're looking at those. So make sure, you know, whatever they're doing, make sure they're partnering with people that can add value, you know, use a accountant or CPA or, you know, um, uh, financial planners can help you with this kind of thing too. Um, so that it's important to have the right team, you know, someone like yourself who provides insurance, making sure that, that the, the home is properly insured, um, and that the renters have insurance as well. Things like that are really important when you're doing this. I appreciate you uh, reiterating that. I think it's, um, you know, real estate is always uh, in vogue when uh, rates are low and, you know, people have bought yeah. stuff for low and they, <clears throat> they're flipping in and out of it. And, and it's almost seemed like as a stock, you know, because people are able to get in, get right. out, make a big, big money, or, or you hear about the big cash flow deals or whatever. Uh, but, but truly, it's an overtime kind of thing. And I yeah. think the, the, the real 
uh, test of it is that it's not easy to sell a property. You know, right. so it's, when you get in, you better have a plan to stay in for a while because, right. you know, you, you know, it, just the transaction cost. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got uh, commissions and, and all that stuff. So I think that for, for myself, it, it's, it's been kind of a, you know, it's been rewarding in that I haven't really, I mean, I, I do have kind of like my, my little sheet that I kind of like look at occasionally just mm -hmm. to see how things are, you know, based on whatever the, the, the values are, you know, presumed to be, as opposed to how much is owed and, and kind of that just as kind of a reference point, but it's not, it's not like money I can go spend. Uh, the whole right. goal for, for an investor is to create a, a nest egg that yeah. is large enough that then it, it's, you know, purpose is that it throws off capital as opposed to something, right. you're, you know, you're working down to zero kind of thing, which is the, yeah. what the, the stock market uh, model really is, is, is to, you know, get enough to where they can get you to the end and, you know, get you, you know, settled up there, but uh, definitely a, a different mindset. Um, hey, one of the, the questions that, that you, you uh, have touched on a little bit about uh, the products you have uh, in, in that you can go, is it pretty much one to four doors? Is that kind of the, the real sweet spot for the uh, yeah. investor? It really is for, for what we do. We do have a, we have one product that can go five to eight units. Um, but again, it's a larger down payment. Once you get over four units, you into that five plus units, it is a pure commercial and it pretty much is always um, based on the property's ability to service the debt, right? right? So, you know, I mentioned that we have this uh, debt service coverage ratio product. Uh, they call it DSCR. That's kind of how, and again, I'm not an expert on the commercial side, um, but, but um, really once you get over five units and higher, that's when they're really commercial. looking at, hey, does this thing pay for itself, right? They're not, they're not looking at, the borrower's yeah, qualifications. Yeah. Whereas when we do a loan, we're looking at it in relation to not only the property, but also all their other debts, right? right. Do they qualify with everything else they have? Um, and, and so we're, they're personally liable for those. Um, and again, I think they are on commercial too, but um, it's, it's a little different how they look at those. Right. And so what I wanted to, to ask beyond that is, uh, what what are the number of loans an individual can have? I mean, at one point there mm -hmm. was a there was a yeah. limit. I think it was four, uh, and I don't know yeah. what the what, what's the current market or yeah, or is there a a number right you know, that you're limited right. to? Right. So um, your traditional agency loan, so Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they have a limit of ten finance properties, right? So you could have up to 10. So if I'm doing a financing for someone and this is their 10th finance property um, and you're going to count your primary and every other home that's financed, that's the last one I can do with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, right? Um, now, there are other investors who don't have limits. So I did, I had a customer that I helped a couple of years ago and this particular investor had uh, over a hundred properties. Um, and, um, you know, 50 of them were in their own name, 50 of them were in an LLC, were, were in a um, kind of an LLC and the, the LLC hold, held them, but they had too many for me to be able to do that. And we were able to um, refinance them with one of my portfolio lenders where they didn't have a limit on that, save them a lot, you know, got the rates down, even consolidated some of, some of the debts. Once you start getting into over 10, um, really there's, there's other ways to look at that too. Sometimes banks will package five or six properties in one if you have that in a LLC, for example, and give you one loan. And so it can really vary. Um, we even have, you know, again, we have a jumbo option for those who have more than 10 finance property. It doesn't mean how many properties you have, but it's how many you have finance, right? So you might have 20 properties, but this is only, if this is going to be your 10th finance one, then that's the maximum we can do with um, any ready loans. Now, if you're doing, that's for purchase. If you're doing, or a rate term refinance, if you're doing cash out, there are some other limitations when it comes to cash out refinances. The debt to income ratios come a lot, come in a lot lower too when you have more than four. So important Got to it. be 
talking to a to a professional yeah no i just i remember um you know just kind of the nuance of it and and at the yeah. time i uh i don't remember how many i had but i know that it it put my loan in a different category right um and uh i think when the 08 thing blew up and there was all these lower refinancing options available for whatever reason i had one that it wasn't it didn't qualify it was like a I think it was a Freddie Mac as opposed to a Fannie Mae. There was like a differentiation between they, yeah. one agency made it available, the others didn't. And, yeah, I think uh, they did for a while have, and, and I'm not remembering off the top yeah. of my head, but I think for a while, one of them had a limit of six and the other had a limit of 10. And yeah. um, they will have different requirements, which I think is great. Honestly, it's nice having a couple different agencies that, you you know, give us different ways to help help our clients. Yeah. No, I just, I remember thinking like, well, I didn't decide which one, you, you know, how did, right. how did I end up here? Kind of thing. But, right. You know, <laughs> right. Well, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, I think when you are doing, you're looking at this, it's important to do some planning, right? It's, you know, not only do you do the investment analysis, but you also look at like, how long do I want to hold it? How many do I want to have? Um, and just work with someone that can help you do some, you know, we call it mortgage planning, right? You do a little bit of, planning around that mortgage. And maybe even I've had situations where I've been with the client and we've had their CPA with us. We've had their financial planner with us. And we're all there in the same room talking about how real estate fits into their overall um, investment plan, right? Those are, those are great because I don't have, you know, the expertise as a CPA or as an investment advisor. I've got the mortgage expertise and they don't necessarily know all the rules around. So bringing your 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 team together, right? Having a team, and might maybe even an, an insurance person, um, because there's different requirements around all those things. You want to definitely make sure that you're protecting yourself when it comes to, um, you know, all the all your different needs and different. You look at it in light of your whole um, whole package, really, and not just in isolation. I think is really important. No. Well, well said, and, and definitely having some some sort of a plan and a strategy that you can act on it. It definitely will make it a, a smoother um, go forward as opposed to uh, a new plan and and you know no ability to execute kind of things. That's yeah, it's good. Yeah, I mean, one other thing I will throw out there that's kind of interesting. We used to see this a whole lot more, but it's seller financed. Um, you know, uh, and sometimes especially in a market where things aren't selling as quickly, um, you might even have sellers who are willing to provide the seller carry financing. Um, like I said, we used to see that a lot more um, and they would even do second liens or other things. Um, but, you know, something to, to think about when you're in this market, um, there's a, there are still different ways to do that. It doesn't have to be a traditional mortgage like we're talking about or, or you know, uh, you know, note and trustee, it could be a seller that carries the note for you. Maybe they don't want, they want to sell, but they don't want to take all of that money right now. They'd rather have that money working for them. And maybe an investor can um, get an even better rate working directly with the seller. Uh, but again, it's important to have maybe an attorney, real estate attorney, help draft um, agreements and, and um, the notes and trustees and those kind of things too. So like I said, be be sure to work with professionals because um, you want to make sure that you have somebody looking out for you and it's not just the seller who's writing it up or you're getting it off, you're getting it online and writing it up yourself, something like that. So. Well, I love, I love you. Uh, the fact that you brought that up because um, one of the things I think that, you know, uh, investors that are just getting started, if they've bought a primary home, and they went through a realtor and ended up with a mortgage yeah. broker. And, you know, there's a, there's a marketplace and that's fairly routine. I mean, there's a, the MLS yep. where you can find the homes, you know, three yep. bed, two bath, you know, that fits your budget in the neighborhood, the school district, whatever it is you're looking for. And when you go into the investor world, it, it really is kind of like the wild west from a standpoint of yeah. flexibility. Uh, if your imagination allows you to think outside the box and you've got a seller that's you know, agreeable, you know, whatever you, you agree to is, mm -hmm. is available to you. It's not like, 
uh, it is like with a primary home and that. And, and, and uh, so, I mean, the, the fact that you brought that up, I really appreciate that. Cause that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's really where the, the, you know, kind of the, the, the genesis or the ability to really become an investor uh, might, might be uh, for somebody yeah. listening right now. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bet. So, Hey, Brad, if we could, I'd like to uh, shift gears here for a second. Sure. Uh, by day, I'm an insurance broker. And uh, as such, I work with my clients to assess risk and determine what to do with the risk. And there's uh, three strategies we typically consider. Uh, we first look to see if there's a way we can avoid the risk. And mm -hmm. that's not an option. Then we look to see if there's a way we can minimize the risk. And when uh, we cannot avoid nor minimize the risk, we look to transfer the risk. And that's what an insurance mm -hmm. policy is. And uh, as such, I like to ask my guests if they can look at their own situation. Uh, could be clients, investors, tenants, uh, the market, interest rates, politics, however you choose to, div to identify uh, what you consider to be the biggest risk. Mm -hmm. And um, for clarification, uh, again, while I'm an insurance broker, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related answer. Yeah. And, uh, so I'd like to ask you, Brad Hansen, what is the biggest risk? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think, you know, there's a couple of them. Number one, I, and I've mentioned a few of these. Number one, I think you have to be really careful um, trying to do too much too quickly, right? It's like anything, the more experience you get, the better you'll be at it, knowledge. So I always say, hey, walk before you run, right? Um, and make sure that you're not, um, you know, if you're going to buy an investment property, do it in an area that you know, um, do it do it in such a way that you're going to minimize the risks, right? You, you know, the, you, you know, have professionals help you, right? You know, the value of the home, you're not overpaying. Uh, it's going to cash flow, those kind of things. So, you know, one of the risks is that you have a home that has a negative cash flow, right? Let's say you overpay uh, and rates are high right now, right? So your rates, your payment's going to be relatively high, but let's say, you have a payment that's 3,500, but you can only rent it for 3,000. Well, now all of a sudden you've got a $500 a month negative cash flow. Um, so, you know, again, knowing what you're getting into and not just, you know, it can be, as you said, it could be a little bit um, kind of glamorized a little bit, right? That's a lot of hard work. Um, you know, are you, are you gonna, or gonna hire a, a, um, a property management company? Or are you gonna manage yourself? Are you going to hire a handyman to help take care of repairs? You know, those kind of things, because stuff goes out, right? Are you going to set aside money for maintenance? So there's a lot that goes into it. I would say, you know, that's a risk, but it can be mitigated by educating yourself, surrounding yourself with, with professionals. So walk before you run is another one. The other risk potentially is um, home values might go down, right? Um, now, while we don't necessarily think the environment's similar to what happened in 08, where we saw 25 to 30% declines because of the oversupply and the, the, a lot of the other things that were happening with the home financing wasn't great, um, we don't think that's the same environment we have. If you overpay, you could see values go down, but that I think that can be mitigated to a degree by what we talked about earlier. If you're going to buy it, um, don't expect that it's going to give you the return on investment that you want in just the first year or two might take multiple years for that so like anything it is a risk it's money that can be lost uh, but i think i mean honestly i think the biggest risk is that negative cash flow maybe buying a property uh, again i always recommend that you get a really thorough uh, inspection you found a property that had um that you, you didn't do an inspection um and you ended up having to put a new roof in, or you had other issues, right? So like you, you, you know, again, I'm not insurance. You, there are things that insurance can protect you from, but insurance can't necessarily protect you from buying a home that is in disrepair and needs a lot of work, right? So um, those are probably the biggest risks that I, I see, and there's ways to mitigate those and be prepared for them. But uh, yeah, those are, those are probably two of the biggest ones I've seen. Yeah. No, well, well put there. Uh, definitely, insurance company doesn't want to rehab your home there for you. That's <laughs> no. a good, good way to get yourself canceled. But uh, that's good. Right. Hey, Brad, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? 
Yeah, yeah and you know, number one, they can go to my website. Um, um, again, I'm with Academy Mortgage and they can go to myportlandmortgage.com. If you go to myportlandmortgage.com, you'll see my website. All my contact information is on there. I'm also at brad.hanson at academymortgage.com is my email. Um, people can reach out to me. My phone number is 503-544-8504. Uh, love helping people, you know, really just, you know, with my experience, um, love helping be an advisor for people to help them with that mortgage plan, helping bring other people together to help them be successful in uh, real estate. Awesome. Brad, I can't say thanks enough for uh, taking the time to talk. I've, uh, yeah, thank you. I've enjoyed it and uh, learned a lot and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a bunch. Always fun uh, talking about what we love. All right. All right. All right. Take care. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.